From the 15th to the 19th century, six million Africans were kidnapped and forcibly transported across the Atlantic by Portuguese vessels and sold into slavery, primarily to Brazil. But so far, Portugal has rarely commented on its past, and little is taught about its role in slavery in schools. Rather, the country's colonial era, which subjugated countries including Angola, Mozambique, Brazil, Cape Verde, and East Timor, as well as parts of India, is often perceived as a source of pride by most Portuguese. In April 2022, Portugal's president, Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, would say his country should apologize and take responsibility for its role in the transatlantic slave trade. However, there has not been a formal apology or even reparations to the countries that were subjugated or the people that have to been on the other side of the brutal slave trade. The Portuguese have always covered up this stain on its history. In Portugal, it is always said that slavery was not an invention of the Portuguese or the Europeans and that there always were slaves, even before the 15th century. But the fact is that during the age of the discoveries, beginning in the 15th century, the slave trade took on a transatlantic dimension. By opening up sea routes to Africa, Asia and America, Western European countries, led by Portugal, rose to become internationally active trading and colonial powers. Despite the importance of chattel slavery to the making of Portugal and its overseas empire, this terrifying history of black bondage is entirely muted in the public memory of Lisbon, the capital of Portugal. In contrast to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the United States or the Museo Afro Brazil in Sao Paulo, Brazil, there are no such museums or reckoning public memorials in Lisbon along the lines of the Memorial de l'Abolition d'Esclavage as in Nantes, France. More recently, however, a slavery museum was established in the historic Mercado de Escravos, or slave market of the southern Portuguese port of Lagos, which is said to be the site of the first trade in enslaved Africans in Europe. Yet, Lisbon remains largely silent on its legacy of white terror and black captivity. In this video, we are going to turn back the hands of time and reveal the secrets that Portugal hoped to bury. We are going to talk about how a tiny European nation was responsible for the suffering and death of millions of black individuals, how they plundered and subjugated the African continent, and in all their atrocities, they were backed by the church. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. Portuguese expansion into Africa began with the desire of King John I to gain access to the gold-producing areas of West Africa. The trans-Saharan trade routes between Songhay and the North African traders provided Europe with gold coins used to trade spices, silks, and other luxuries from India. At the time, there was a shortage of gold and rumors were spreading that there were states in the south of Africa which had gold. This news encouraged King John's son, Prince Henry, to send out expeditions to explore these possibilities. At first, the Portuguese established trading stations along the west coast of Africa rather than permanent settlements. They built forts at Cape Blanco, Sierra Leone, and Elmina to protect their trading stations from rival European traders. In this way, the Portuguese diverted the trade in gold and slaves away from the trans-Saharan routes, causing their decline, and increased their own status as a powerful trading nation. During the 1480s, the Portuguese came into contact with the Kingdom of the Congo, situated south of the Congo River in what is today northern Angola. The Congo became powerful through war and capturing and enslaving the people they defeated. The Portuguese did not conquer this region, but chose rather to become allies of the Congo king. The king was eager to make use of Portuguese teachers and craftsmen to train his people. He also allowed Catholic missionaries to work among his people. The Portuguese traded guns for slaves captured by the Congo in wars against rival kingdoms in the interior. Sometime between 1441 and 1484, the first black captives from West Africa landed on the Portuguese beach of Lagos. The first record of the trans altantic slave trade was marred by the Goncalves' voyage. According to Portuguese royal chronicler Gomes Ains de Zurara, Antom Goncalves was a young ship captain who sailed to West Africa in 1441, hoping to acquire seal skins and oil. After obtaining his cargo, Goncalves called a meeting of the 21 sailors who accompanied him and unveiled his plan to increase their profits. That night, Goncalves led a raiding party into Cap Blanc, a narrow peninsula between Western Sahara and Mauritania, and kidnapped two Berbers, one man and one woman. Another Portuguese mariner, Nuno Tristão, and members of his crew soon joined Goncalves. Although the raid resulted in less than a dozen captives, 
The possibility of getting more captives made it seem like a profitable venture. Upon returning to Portugal, Goncalves treated his captives in accordance with this custom and allowed them to negotiate the terms of their release. Rather than offering a ransom of money, the captives promised to give Goncalves 10 slaves in exchange for their own freedom and safe passage home. According to royal chronicler Zarara, the Berbers explained that these new captives would be black and not of the lineage of Moors, but Gentiles. Thus, in 1442, Goncalves returned his Berber captives to Western Sahara, receiving as payment 10 enslaved sub-Saharan Africans, whom he then transported back to Portugal for resale. Notably, the treatment of black Gentiles was addressed in 1452 and 1455, when Pope Nicholas V issued a series of papal bulls that granted Portugal the right to enslave sub-Saharan Africans. Church leaders argued that slavery served as a natural deterrent and Christianizing influence to barbarous behavior among pagans. Using this logic, the Pope issued a mandate to the Portuguese king, Alfonso V, and instructed him to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. Many, many more kidnapped captives would follow this first group of 240 enslaved Africans. While Lagos saw the creation of the first slave market in Portugal and Europe as a whole, Lisbon soon became the administrative and later physical center of the human traffic. Over the course of two decades, the center of the Portuguese slave trade was redirected from Lagos to Lisbon, where royal authorities could closely monitor it. In 1486, the Portuguese crown created the Casa dos Escravos de Lisboa, or the Lisbon Slave House, which was established to process the arrival, taxation, and eventual selling of African captives into Lisbon, thereby centralizing and formalizing the trade. Located near the shipyards and landing docks of the Tejo River, enslaved Africans largely from Argium, Benin, and the Congo were marched in chains to the prison of the Casa dos Escravos before their physical evaluation and auction in the public square known as Pelourinho Velho. In an attempt to solidify Lisbon's hold on the trade, in 1512, the Portuguese king ordered that all slaves entering Portugal would be required to disembark in Lisbon. Heavy penalties and fines awaited those who failed to follow. During transport to Portugal, enslaved people were fastened and chained with manacles, padlocks, and rings around their necks. Portuguese owners could whip, chain, and pour burning hot wax and fat onto the skin of their slaves and punish their slaves in any way that they wished, as long as the slaves remained alive. The Portuguese also used branding irons to brand their slaves as property. The occupations of slaves varied widely. Some slaves in Lisbon could find themselves working in domestic settings, but most worked hard labor in the mines and metal forges, while others worked at the docks loading and maintaining ships. Some slaves worked peddling cheap goods at the markets and returning the profits to their masters. Opportunities for slaves to become free were scarce, however, there were many instances in which slaves had either elevated their status or obtained their freedom. Slaves were able to buy their freedom by saving any earnings, so long as their masters allow them to keep their earnings or purchase a slave to replace them. Women slaves could be freed if their masters chose to marry them, but this was more common among the colonies. When Lisbon was on the verge of being invaded in 1580, slaves were promised their freedom in exchange for their military service. 440 slaves took the offer and most, after being freed, left Portugal. Black female slaves were desired for sexual purposes, resulting in many mixed-race offspring. This prompted the Council of Trent in 1563 to denounce the widespread immorality. Most of the slaves imported from Africa by the Portuguese ended up in Brazil, where they would labor day and night to build the economy of the country. The Portuguese first traveled to Brazil in 1500s under the expedition of Pedro Álvarez Cabral, though the first Portuguese settlement was not established until 1516. Soon after the arrival of the Portuguese, it became clear a commercial colonial undertaking would be difficult on such a vast continent. Indigenous slave labor was quickly turned to for agricultural workforce needs, particularly due to the labor demands of the expanding sugar industry. During the Atlantic slave trade era, Brazil imported more enslaved Africans than any other country in the world. Brazil's foundation was built on the exploitation and enslavement of indigenous peoples and black Africans.
Out of the 12 million Africans who were forcibly brought to the New World, approximately 5.5 million were brought to Brazil between 1540 and the 1860s. The mass enslavement of Africans played a pivotal role in the country's economy and was responsible for the production of vast amounts of wealth. The inhumane treatment and forced labor of enslaved Africans remains a significant part of Brazil's history and its ongoing struggle with systemic racism. Until the early 1850s, most enslaved African people who arrived on Brazilian shores were forced to embark at West Central African ports, especially in Luanda, which is present-day Angola. Slave labor was the driving force behind the growth of the sugar economy in Brazil, and sugar was the primary export of the colony from 1600 to 1650. Gold and diamond deposits were discovered in Brazil in 1690, which sparked an increase in the importation of enslaved African people to power this newly profitable mining. Transportation systems were developed for the mining infrastructure, and population boomed from immigrants seeking to take part in gold and diamond mining. Demand for enslaved Africans did not wane after the decline of the mining industry in the second half of the 18th century. Cattle ranching and foodstuff production proliferated after the population growth, both of which relied heavily on slave labor. 1.7 million slaves were imported to Brazil from Africa from 1700 to 1800, and the rise of coffee in the 1830s further expanded the Atlantic slave trade. All in all, millions of slaves were transported from Africa to Brazil, more than any other nation in the Western Hemisphere. The slave trade had devastating effects in Africa, which can still be felt today. Economic incentives for warlords and tribes to engage in the slave trade promoted an atmosphere of lawlessness and violence. Depopulation and a continuing fear of captivity made economic and agricultural development almost impossible throughout much of Western Africa. The African continent was bled of its human resources via all possible routes. Africa suffered from a lack of workforce and therefore was not able to keep up with economical development of other countries. Europe and America's economies flourished, plantations grew, and agriculture emerged as a new business worldwide. The slave trade also changed the political configuration in that an administrative class was replaced with a warrior class whose sole purpose was slave raiding. The causal chain evoked by the slave trade is still visible today in the underdevelopment of the continent. The loss of people and the following effects prevented the continent from developing markets and extending general commercialization of economic activities. Africa was not able to keep up with other economies and therefore was not in the position to extend their markets to international business and stability within the continent itself. On the contrary, they helped Western states to develop through additional human labor. As a result, Africa was prevented from developing internally as well as and internationally. Beyond denying Africa of the much-needed human capital, the export of slaves also altered the continent's population with the impact being felt in modern societies. Existing data estimates that in 1750, African population accounted for 13% of the global population, which dropped to 8% in 1900s. Only in 2014, some 250 years later, did the population return to 13%. Reproduction was also affected by introduction of venereal diseases that were brought by slave merchants, especially from Europe. The Mpongwe people of Gabon, for example, suffered a huge population loss following an outbreak of syphilis and smallpox introduced by European slave traders. Most of those who died were at the prime of their reproductive years. But what perhaps continued to be the most pronounced impact of slavery on contemporary Africa is racism and skewed value judgments that created class, social status, and respect based on color. As slavery ended in other areas, slave traders found new frontiers in Africa, with the trade still being practiced in the 19th century. With Africa having been the last to carry the tag and prejudice associated with slaves who are treated as second-class citizens, the color hierarchies have persisted to modern society. While the slave trade would come to an end in 1808, it didn't mean the European left the African continent and its rich resources alone. With slavery out, another form of slavery was born. The colonization and control of African resources and its people would begin. By the late 18th century, after the abolition of slavery, Portugal would maintain control over the small colonies of Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, and Sao Tome, and Principe in West Africa, and the much more extensive but largely undeveloped colonies of Angola and Mozambique in Southern Africa. The African colonies played a critical role in the Portuguese economy. They provided a protected market, 
supplying raw materials at prices cheaper than the world market rates, and buying Portuguese products that had a low world demand. Foreign exchange earnings from exports and services also reduced the chronic deficit on Portugal's balance of trade. To safeguard the advantages brought by the colonies, the Portuguese had to protect the white population in Lusophone, or Portuguese-speaking Africa, against possible African competition by the policy of economic segregation. To do this, a high number of impoverished whites emigrated to the colonies. The immigration relieved population pressure in Portugal, one of the most crowded and poorest countries in Europe. Of equal importance to Portugal, the white settlers provided a bulwark against rebellious Africans and covetous Europeans in neighboring African countries. Accordingly, whites were congregated in the cities or other places of critical economic importance. They pressured Portugal to defend their interests with edicts that favored whites over Africans and Creoles. For the next four decades, the Portuguese conducted an ongoing military campaign to subjugate the native African populations of its colonies in southern Africa. By the beginning of the 20th century, they had subdued the populous Ovimbundu states in central Angola. The large kingdom of the Kwanhana in southern Angola was not vanquished, however, until after World War I. Indeed, although the Portuguese formally declared in 1922 that Angola had been pacified, armed resistance to Portuguese rule continued throughout the colony, especially among the Bakongo and Mbundi people of northern Angola. In the process of pacification, the native Africans were displaced, and through a decree that made it a crime to be unemployed, most were forced to labor on the extensive coffee plantations that were established by the colonials. Between 1939 and 1943, the Portuguese army carried out operations against the nomadic Mukubal people, accused of rebellion, which led to the death of half their population. The survivors were incarcerated in concentration camps, sent to forced labor camps, where the great majority of them perished due to the brutality of the work system, undernourishment, and executions. In both Angola and Mozambique, the rise of the dictatorial regime of Antonio Salazar in 1932 in Portugal meant an increasingly repressive reaction to African demands for just treatment and political and economic rights. Especially in Angola, the Portuguese became expert at exploiting long-standing tensions among the dominant ethnic groups. After the end of the international slave trade in the 1830s, Portugal's small West African colonies decreased in importance and became increasingly impoverished. The Portuguese attempted to establish a plantation economy, but the fields in the Cape Verde Islands, in particular, were devastated by cyclic droughts. The Portuguese lacked the resources to compensate for the crop failures, and in at least seven periods between the 1770s and the late 1940s, between 15% and 40% of the island's population starved to death as a consequence. After 18% perished from 1948 to 1949, the Portuguese government responded to international pressure, and in 1951 designated the Cape Verde Islands as a province of Portugal. Educational and economic opportunities within Portugal were open to Cape Verdeans. Some of those educated in Portugal then returned to Cape Verde and went to Guinea-Bissau and Sao Tome in order to provide the nucleus of an independence movement. In 1963, an active insurgency began in Guinea-Bissau, but it would take just over a decade for the ongoing insurgencies in all of Portugal's African colonies to cause the collapse of the Salazar regime and to achieve independence. After Salazar's regime collapsed in 1974 and the new Portuguese government committed itself to a quick transition to independence in the colonies, the United States and Soviet Union supported contending African factions in the now independent states, factions that they supported through, respectively, South African and Cuban surrogate forces. For the next decade and a half, both Angola and Mozambique were devastated by these ongoing and often very anarchic conflicts. By 2006, their economies had still not become self-sustaining, and large portions of their populations remained in refugee camps where large commitments of foreign aid provided basic foodstuffs and rudimentary medical care as a stopgap against mass starvation and epidemics. The reality of Portugal's role in the African slave trade and colonization is a painful chapter in history, one marked by devastation and enduring consequences. The impact of this dark period continues to resonate across the African continent, where communities and economies of Angola, Mozambique, and other former colonies were ravaged by centuries of exploitation and oppression. Despite the undeniable suffering inflicted upon African nations, Portugal has yet to acknowledge its responsibility 
offer reparations, or express genuine remorse for its actions. The absence of restitution and a heartfelt apology stands as a glaring injustice, a reminder of the unhealed wounds that persist. As the affected countries and peoples of Africa navigate the complexities of their post-colonial journey, there remains hope that the continent will rise once again to its former glory. Through collective efforts, resilience, and the restoration of cultural and economic foundations, Africa has the potential to reclaim its rightful place on the global stage, drawing strength from the richness of its history and the unity of its diverse peoples. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.